Welcome to the Path to Be Well podcast, a podcast about being well. I'm Doug Rawson. Join me, Mark Trombley and Paul Glory, each week as we answer your questions with the sole purpose of helping people who suffer from a chronic medical condition and considering the safe use of cannabis so you can have a better quality of life. In this podcast episode, Mark and Paul discuss a common medical condition that people seek relief with cannabis. Depression affects many people. And working collaboratively with your healthcare team is essential while ruling out other possible medical conditions contributing to your current state of health. Additionally, cannabis may not necessarily be the right treatment option and proceeding in a safe and cautious manner will help evaluate the response to treatment. This approach is essential regardless of the treatment plan. As you progress, remember to journal your results to help assess the successes you are seeing. You can access a copy of a health journal at weedwell.tips. You have healthcare choices that enable you to achieve your health goals. We hope this quick tips episode will help form a treatment plan aligned to your health goals. If you have a topic that you would like covered in a future podcast episode, please leave a comment at weedwell.com. Now, let's join in on the conversation. Welcome to our broadcast, The Path to Be Well, Knowledge and Learning Session. Joining me today is my colleague, Paul, and our topic is focused on depression, the factors that go into a diagnosis, and whether cannabis is an appropriate treatment for this condition. You won't want to miss it, so do stay tuned. To all our listeners, we're so happy that you've joined us today. And just a reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can do that uh, at weedwell.tv. Now, these sessions are focused on adding clarity regarding cannabis as a treatment option and whether or not it's right for you. And we'll bring clarity and help you make informed decisions with respect to improving your quality of life. Now, you may know someone that could benefit from this information. So please do them and us a favor by having them subscribe to our Facebook page or join our group at weedwell.group. My name is Mark Trombley, a founding member of Simcoe Holistic Health and Weedwell. I want to share with you how I became involved with cannabis as a medicine. As a teenager, I did sample marijuana and quickly concluded that it just wasn't for me. I will admit, I did find myself judging those who did consume marijuana thinking that their sole motive was to get high. It wasn't until many years later that I discovered the true medical benefits of marijuana. A loved one was diagnosed with MS, and after many months of symptom manifestation resulting in sleepless nights, I witnessed firsthand how cannabis can help alleviate symptoms and improve sleep. My eyes were open and my interests further increased. As a result, Simcoe Holistic Health opened its doors in 2013, and since then we have served nearly 6,000 patients ranging from ages 3 to 93. I have personally witnessed countless individuals and families experience improved quality of life. Now, having said that, I've also observed that cannabis treatment is simply not for everyone. And for that reason, I want to caution our listeners that cannabis treatment is not a one-size-fits-all. Determining if cannabis is an appropriate, appropriate treatment requires the attention, care, and focus of your healthcare team. At Weedwell, we are committed to helping people improve their quality of life, and utilizing cannabis as a treatment option is one way to accomplish that. So as I said earlier, joining me is my colleague, Paul. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Mark, and good day to you. And, you know, looking through uh, the week so far, you've had quite the uh, range of discussions with our audience on depression, and I, I like where a lot of that went to, and I think we'll touch on a lot of the points, maybe talk about them in a little more detail today. 
But we'll start with our manifesto this week, and it's, I have healthcare choices that enable me to achieve my health goals. And we'll try to tie that in as we discuss today where cannabis might fit in with depression, getting diagnosed uh, with depression and, and things like that. What I noticed right away in your Be, Be Clear session, what is a depression assessment? And the assessment, there's, there's many of them. The assess- we even use one in the clinic. But uh, the assessment is but one tool. Your score on an assessment, on any assessment, doesn't say you are or you're not. Especially in the case of depression, it will require discussion with a psychiatrist, psychologist, people who are trained in, in this field to make diagnosis. That was the first thing that I noticed. You were talking depression assessments. wanted to bring that up. Do you want to share some of the other things you were going over this week uh, so far? Yeah, Paul, the assessment was a big thing. Primary uh, versus secondary was the other thing. And honestly, I'm, I'm really keen and looking forward to your view and interpretation of that as well. The way I kind of summarized it is, is that in the case of depression as secondary, that there would be a dominant chronic condition in your body that caused you to you know, feel depressed. So depressed was a secondary condition to, you know, the primary condition. That could have been as a result of an injury, an accident that took away your mobility or took away the things that you used to enjoy doing and not being able to do that. That was the topic, I believe, on Tuesday this week. Excellent. It sounds like it was really nicely done and and excellent points. and, And we'll piggyback off that. Maybe we'll go back to the start, though, and we'll actually talk the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. So think of it like a Bible or the book and where you're going to find your list of criteria for diagnosis. So depression's in here. Substance use disorder is in here. There's a whole wide array of conditions. And, and this is where you would find, or doctors and whatnot are, are finding and following along to you check this, you have this, you have this, and how do they come to that? And so really, I'm just going to read off some of the things that that we're looking or the doctors, the professionals are looking for when it comes to that. And so uh, we talk about a depressed mood most days, nearly all days. And let's just qualify this uh, before I even go any further that everyone's entitled to feel sad. You know, if a family member dies, you're going to feel sad. If you've lost your job for whatever reason, you're going to feel sad. This is different depression than we would be talking. We're talking about longer term months, if not years. And so when we say this happens nearly every day, this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about the sadness that you might feel the days and weeks following a death of a a family member, just to be clear. So we talk about diminished interest in things that you used to enjoy. And so you just have no get up and go to do the activities that you used to like. And you end up being more shut in, if you will. Unintended weight loss or changes in appetite. And so this, this when we say unintended, it's not I started a diet and I want to lose weight. This is just happening because you have no interest in eating. And, and as a result, you end up generally losing weight. But it, it can be an increase in weight as well. With these kind of not feeling like doing anything, uh, we talk fatigue and just general malaise. And, and, and again, I think I word it as not having the get up to go. The ability to concentrate, decision making, uh, these tend to decrease or deteriorate when we're talking depression. And then when we get into things like guilt and then stuff like that, this might actually lead into suicidal thoughts or thoughts of self-harm and stuff like that. And so you get a wide array and you don't need every single one. The criteria is, you, well, you need quite a number of them, uh, but they need to be occurring all the time. And as I said, it's not transient or temporary like the change of a, of a, of a life event. This is ongoing. And so, you know, if, if you're listening and you, you feel as though you have a lot of those, it doesn't make the diagnosis. It's definitely a precursor to you to go talk to someone. One of the things with depression diagnosis and these symptoms, they fit a number of medical conditions as well. 
And so quite often, it would not be surprising if you had various tests for certain organs, blood tests to see the levels of different things. The first thing that would come to mind is thyroid levels, as being depressed could produce a lot of these symptoms. And so you would want, what the physician would do is, is rule out a lot of things. So you might end up back at depression, but you want to make sure, you know, mimic condition A, B, C, D, and E are all checked off and ruled out. And then you kind of end up at depression as opposed to landing on depression first and, and not doing a full assessment, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. And I'm happy you're going down this path because I, I just barely touched on some of that this week. I did talk about the PHQ-9, that it's not an assessment tool. It can help guide the physician through the process of prescribing and, and monitoring results from, from time to time. But the key point here that I try to really stress, while in all medical condition, but very specifically, anything that has to do with your mental well-being, don't try to tackle this on your own. Do seek professional medical uh, help, advice, and guidance for that. It is so, so critical because you can end up going down a path that you would, you know, by far prefer not to, if, if you had it, you know, to, to, to choose. A hundred percent agree. And, you know, your first discussion is, is it, it, with these symptoms that I talked about, your general practitioner, and they might be the ones to get the ball rolling in so far as, 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 as the blood tests that I said, or, or this, we'll say the organ function test things that if they're off, they'll produce these symptoms. And then they can lead you into, uh, we'll say, the, the specialist or the person that's, if that's where it ends up going, that can help you with this. And so that's, that's kind of what goes into a diagnosis and sometimes why it takes so long. You mentioned uh, your, your be aware topic as, as uh, primary versus secondary. And so I'm not sure that I would find this in literature. I, it's kind of something that I've just seen in the clinic setting more than anything. And, and it's the person and, and, you know, you've met these people over the years as well. The person that comes in and the, they have a diagnosis of depression sometimes and and with a lot of mental health disorders there may be overlap whether that's PTSD and depression anxiety and depression it's not uncommon yet another reason why you need to see a professional to see exactly where you're at with that but you have the person that really is just coming in with that and then the individual that is like you said suffered a debilitating accident can't get out of bed or was bedridden for months and never got back to their old normal. And and now, the de because this has been months or years long, the depression really has set in, and this person has experienced more a secondary depression or a depression as a result of this primary event. And so that's the only reason we're, we'll, we'll say we're separating the two. The other thing is we tend to see differences in treatment, which we'll get to uh, later on insofar as success goes with cannabis. So, you know, it's really nice that you brought that up. The other thing you mentioned is just a second ago with the PHQ-9, so a qualitative analysis, how I feel. That in and of itself, you'll get a score and it, 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 the score will relate to you're in the mild category or major category or whatever. It's not a diagnosis. Where we find this tool to be useful is when you're comparing to yourself. So it doesn't even work if Mark scores a 15 on it and I score a 12. We, we can't compare because we're in different mindsets the way we would interpret each question would differ. And that would be across the board for the nine questions using this uh, test as an example. Where it does matter though, is when you want to evaluate treatment and if Mark, you scored a 15, I scored a 12. Well, now we want to compare our results to ourselves. If we're feeling better, in theory, those numbers should reflect, you know, maybe your, yours goes from a 15 to an 8, mine goes from a 12 to a 9, whatever the case may be. But it, it becomes personal as compared to yourself, because generally you're going to answer the questions in about the same manner as you did the first time. And so qualitative assessments are useful for the individual only, but not comparing from person to person. And I know you're going to be talking about this a little bit more, but as, a, as it relates to medicating, how that should be approached. And that would be different in the case of depression as a secondary uh, condition, you know, where the doctor would need to look at 
you know, the primary condition and treat that as well as treating depression along with that. And let's not forget that one will compound on the other. And that could be both negative and positive, right? And I'm sure you have a lot more to say about that. Yeah. And so, you know, the person coming into the clinic or the person reaching out to their doctor, they're in the negative sense, uh, using this as an analogy. And and quite commonly, it's pain. And so we'll see, uh, or the doctor will see a person that is on a pain pill or a condition. Pain pill may be ha- helping to some degree. It's not curing the problem the depression comes in, and then you start to see the same person that's on the painkillers now on uh, an SSRI or SNRI. And I'll explain what those are in just a minute. And so then you become treating two conditions from one incident, if if you will. Often those those individuals are the same one looking to substitute with cannabis. But I'll backtrack for just a second in so far as treatment goes, you know, with depression, one of the go to's is cognitive behavioral therapy. And I don't profess to be a professional by any means in this category of treatment, though I'm aware that it becomes what they're working on is a a different way of approaching things, looking at things. So when we look at things like feeling guilt, it's approaching it from a different way that maybe you're not guilty. And by approaching it a different way, you don't feel it so much. The same thing is the idea of worthlessness. And so it becomes change in mindset is what they're attempting to do. You know, you would work one-on-one with person and, and it, this would go, it's not a, a one-day workshop and, and you're better. This is ongoing. And even then, as time goes on, you're given homework to do on your own based on your own personal situation. Again, another reason why it's important to talk to a professional. And so they can really hone in on where we'll say uh, your issues are as compared to someone else. And so as, as the behavioral therapy goes on, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs or SNRIs, so serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors are common medications. And so if you've in the ter- in terms of SSRIs, if you've heard of Paxil or Citalopram, Prozac, Zoloft, those are common ones in that category. And, and in the SNRIs, Effexor, which I believe is venlafaxin and, and Cymbalta are, are, are common in that category. And so these are common medications, and we'll say a pharmaceutical uh, assistance to the treatment of depression. And so you track yourself down, you know, you have the behavioral therapy, you have medication, and people will have either interest in doing that or limited success in doing that if, if they've given it a try. And this is where they end up coming into the clinic looking as cannabis for an answer to that. And that's just either internet searches or discussion based with, I had a friend who told me about this and we know this story, we've, we've explained this story a lot. And then it becomes a discussion of substitution because there are side effects to every medication and some of these provide not pleasant ones uh, as well. That's kind of, if you will, the, the diagnosis part and, and then what you would see in the treatment part. So the premise on these medications is is your serotonin or your norepinephrine, your feel-good molecules, if you will, by preventing them from being taken away. So reuptake inhibitor, inhibit. The longer they stay out, hopefully the feel-good molecule makes you feel better. That's the idea behind it. That would also be the premise behind a CBD. Uh, as we bring cannabis in now, you know, over time, we've seen a lot of success, people utilizing CBD, especially as as part of their treatment plan. And the idea of this is to block the uptake of anandamide, or the premise on how that would work is to block the uptake of anandamide. And that's our own uh, internal feel-good molecule. And so that's where we see some some success there. Anything to add there, Mark? <laughs> Yeah, very well presented uh, thus far. A lot of uh, knowledge, valuable information, which, by the way, I've kind of prefixed this week's session to be pretty much that. So I know that our viewers and listeners are not being disappointed by no means. So now, having said all that, I just lost my train of thought. But no, uh, you talked about introducing CBD. And I talked about that yesterday, but very quick that many patients have found. Uh, varying degree of relief 
with CBD, you know, and, and we say this all the time, it's not a one size fits all. There, there's a lot of moving parts here uh, with some of the medication that you've already mentioned and how do they work together or not. Hi, Doug here from Weedwell. I wanted to hop in here for a moment as we're excited to share with you how we see our Facebook community grow every day. I want to extend a warm welcome to you and joining our community to get tips, tools, and resources while collaborating with others to support you on your health journey. Look for us at weedwell.group. So we'll go back to the CBD part. It is not a one size fits all. I'll kind of you know, bring in THC to the CBD THC question. And, you know, some will report a benefit to their symptoms uh, based on using THC dominant or THC only product. And, you know, it works for them. Like like you just said, it's not a one size fits all. The one thing you want to keep in mind when you introduce THC is, and this is the other thing about getting a good diagnosis, the depression, if there's a psychotic uh, element to it or psychosis element to it, and psychosis is essentially those times where we'll say uh, you fall out of being in touch with reality. So whether it's hallucinations, delusions, we tend to see this in, in terms of schizophrenia as a psychotic disorder. Because THC-based cannabis can produce some of these exact symptoms, you know, really in the clinic, we've always steered people with, with those conditions away from THC. You know, if you, if you want to give it a try, absolutely do it under the care of a physician, just because there is, uh, we'll say, th- what the cannabis or the THC can do produces similar symptoms to what you might experience on a day-to-day or month-to-month basis. And so it, it's a huge caution, whoa, red light. You really have to discuss the risk reward. And so that's, you know, when we say get a good diagnosis, if there's that psychotic or psychosis portion of it, THC, you know, it's not for you. But, uh, you know, I kind of gave the background to how CBD may work. Studies that I see, you know, just to, to piggyback off your point, the not one size fits all, is you tend to have a, a bump up in, in mood right away. But that doesn't necessarily last a long time for the for the we're talking the straight depression person will say more the primary condition as they're coming in anxiety depression or they might see more benefit to the anxiety than than the depression the ones that you know just looking in the clinic kind of as a as a global look or an overhead look that have the best success is that underlying condition gets better so that pain gets better they're able to move around more and that somehow lifts the mood and lifts where they're at so are they really treating the depression well yeah but the treatment goes back to the primary condition and that's why i i don't know is that your experience too mark you look around the people with depression as the secondary seem to alleviate that symptom much more absolutely paul and i touched on that earlier this week And I I did mention even today is that when you're treating the primary condition, it can overlap and often will and compound on the depression aspect for exactly the reason that you mentioned. If that individual was either bedridden or really with very little mobility and unable to do chores around the house or do things that they enjoy doing, and that could be playing with the kids, that will play, you know, a role on your mental health. Who's kidding who? So if you're able to treat that condition that allows you to do that, it's going to compound and and by all means help the health and the mood condition for sure. So having said all that, as you, you know, put your finger on the treatment or treatments, you know, after you get your good diagnosis that you want to undertake and and whether or not that includes cannabis, this works. This will be some, uh, I don't want to steal your thunder for the rest of the week, but especially as you begin different therapies, journal, write down how you feel, get an idea of how you feel, get in touch with your feelings on how you feel. You know how you feel now, but you really want to evaluate is, you know, especially if you start a couple of things at the same time, whether it's the behavioral therapy, whether it's the SSRI or, or cannabis or however, get a feel on where you you were to where you were at, hopefully in a, in a better state, but even document that in a negative state, because that's something you want to report back to your doctor. There's 
you know, from a pharmaceutical standpoint, multiple medications that if A didn't work for you, they can always shift to B. One thing as I just bring up pharmaceuticals though right now, often these are medications that you can't stop abruptly. And so don't come in to a clinic or don't start a cannabis uh, treatment on your own and stop your SSRI or SNRI on day one with the cannabis. These are really medications that you'll have uh, nasty, nasty effects if you do that, generally speaking. And so you want to wean off of them, but do so under the care of the prescribing doctor. So go back to doctor. We'll say, Bob, I'm looking to get off my effects or how can I do that safely? They'll give you the directions for that. But make sure you don't do that on your own. Yeah, very, very good point, Paul. By all means, a a critical point, really, because you could be undoing what a doctor or yourself have been working towards for quite some time and put you in a spiral downward spin uh, pretty quick. So uh, lastly, you know, I think cannabis in this type of, of condition becomes a tool in the toolbox, something we've said all along. And, you know, these other forms of therapy, there are definitely merits to them. It's not something you want to completely ignore or push off to the side and just get focused on the cannabis. Treat it as kind of another tool in the toolbox. And so, you know, really, if you have two or three tools, the the benefits potentially are are, are much greater. And the first person that comes to, to mind uh, with regards to that was Joe in our, our, our podcast uh, previously, and we've talked about him already, Plug uh, podcast.weedwell.com. You can find it there. But he used cannabis to get himself to a place where he could still do the therapy tool in a toolbox. And so he had, we'll say, a one-two punch and, and, and found himself in, a, over time, a much better place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right, uh, Paul. Paul, I'm just wondering, you've covered a lot and a lot of valuable information. Again, that makes me feel great because I've really been pumping this up all week. And uh, and I know those that follow that and are watching or listening today that uh, they're definitely not uh, disappointed for sure. So, Paul, any other key points or are you at a stage of, you know, just kind of summarizing today's topic? The last thing that I would say, along with the, we'll say more the mental uh, therapy to this, and this works for, again, when we're talking the primary or or the secondary uh, depression, as you start, you know, maybe feeling a little better, uh, we would talk about this in, in more of be well stage. Things like yoga, you might never have tried before and other mindfulness type activities just to get you moving in touch with your body in touch with your mind you may find benefit to that as as incorporating a complementary medicine that would be the last thing that i would uh, add into you know different tools that you can add into your treatment plan yeah and paul uh, if my memory serves me well i believe that that is uh, saturday's topic for me so <laughs> i will touch a little bit more on that i think we're at the point where we'll wrap here and in summary depression is much more than being sad or just having a, a sad period uh of a few days or or even a few weeks based on like a life event or something like that. It's much longer, much more consistent and kind of will say in your face all the time. You know, I read off a number of symptoms that tend to be in the mind, slowing things down, withdrawn, weight loss. And and honestly, they're, they're out there. But if you start feeling a few of these things, you want to talk to a doctor and initiate that conversation as soon as possible, as you notice it being ongoing. And the reason for that is to rule out different causes, different more, we'll say, physical causes to the depression, and then get an actual diagnosis of depression and whether or not it has other facets it's especially psychosis and stuff like that in there. And once you have that diagnosis, then you can really evaluate what treatment plans will work for you, whether it's a cognitive behavioral approach, a pharmaceutical like SSRI approach or cannabis. Understand it's not an either or. It can kind of be all as you try to get uh, well. I, again, I'll just say the cautionary part that you really want to question your use of cannabis, THC cannabis, if, if you have that psychosis uh, element in there, psychotic element in there, and it's just because uh, the cannabis, the THC can produce some of these symptoms, the risk reward is not in your benefit. So really consider that 
get a good diagnosis, evaluate your treatment plan, and, and journal how you feel would be the three kind of take-home points. I'd like to also add that, you know, uh, depression and all the other mental illness conditions that you've mentioned, they are a medical condition. You know, we hear that they're certainly not pleasant, but nothing to be ashamed of. It is a medical condition that in most cases can be treated as well. Do speak to your doctor about that. If you need the assistance of a specialist, ask your doctor to direct you in that path as well. So yeah, that would be my words of encouragement for those listeners or a listener that a loved one is is suffering from one of those conditions to, you know, share that with them. Really document how you feel. And it's it's an excellent point because you know what? If you cut your arm and go to the hospital, they put stitches in it because they can see the cut down your hand. If you're feeling these things, no one can see that. We're dependent or the, the professionals are dependent on how you feel. And so the greater you document or have an idea or when it happens or when it occurs, the better picture you paint that same cut on the arm that we can see, you're going to paint that picture for, for the physician. And so you're 100% right, Mark. It, 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 it's a medical condition. It's just one that requires you to describe more than, and than someone can see. Yeah. And be open about it. Do talk to to people, even those that are close to you, express how you're feeling so that they understand how you're feeling and they know where you're coming from, that they may not put other additional pressure on you, understanding better where you're at. And by all means, your family doctor is uh, is a good place to start. But don't keep to yourself. Do share, do talk and seek help is the best overall advice that we could give. So, Paul, I'm kind of looking forward already to next week's uh, topic, which I did my homework this time and I looked ahead and it's risk factors. What can our viewers and listeners expect next week? Just in a nutshell. Yeah. So we want to talk risk factors in terms of modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So we'll, we'll spend some time identifying what that is. And then the place where you really want to focus your efforts, things you can actually change or alter, we'll say your trajectory of health or trajectory of wellness, whether if you do it or, or avoid this activity. We'll get into a lot of detail on things you can do to help yourself uh, in, in that manner relating to the risk factors. So I'm uh, personally looking forward to that, Paul. It'll be another great uh, session and a great uh, few days leading into that session. So I'm looking forward to that. Now, I just want to remind uh, viewers or listeners that have uh, just joined us or joined us midway through this, you can see you know, the full episode uh, by you know, going to our YouTube uh, channel. And if you're someone that prefers podcasts, in about a week from today, you can go to podcast.weedwell.com and you will find this episode in the podcast, along with many, many others of our knowledge and learning sessions where Paul and I have a similar session, the ones that involve uh, Doug as well, where we kind of summarize our month and the activities and the highlights of the month. But also in there, you'll find many patient testimonies, people that share their stories that you will likely find one that you'll that will resonate with you. And uh, at the very least, they will be inspiring. So I encourage all of our listeners to go to podcast.weedwell.com for those. So, Paul, I guess uh, for you and I, it to next week. And I, I am really looking uh, forward to it. So for myself here, I'd like to do my wrap up. But before we do that, I want to mention that next week, or pardon me, tomorrow being Friday and Saturday, we're going to be talking a little bit more about depression, how that might relate to you or to someone else. So for example, on Friday, you can join us at weedwell.group for additional information. And as Paul touched on already, journaling your path day to day and look for trends or changes to how you feel and, and what your mood is like. So that's Friday. And then Saturday, time to consider complementary medicine to assist in dealing with the root causes of depression. And Paul touched on that as well. Now, Sunday is a special day. This is one that is really dedicated to our listeners and audience, where you get to ask your questions, bring up your topics, send them ahead of time so that we can review them and talk about that on Sunday. So, Lots to look forward to. 
And now for my wrap up and disclosure, I'd like to remind our audience that these information sessions are intended for individuals who are generally in good health and generally well adjusted that are functioning effectively and are not in need of medical treatment, including treatment for mental health disorders. These information sessions do not involve the diagnosis or treatment of any medical or mental disorders and does not prevent, cure, or treat any mental disorder or medical disease. Further, these sessions are not a substitute for therapy, for counseling, psychoanalysis, medical treatment, substance abuse treatment, or the advice or services of a medical professional. It is your responsibility to seek independent guidance from, from medical professionals to the extent that is necessary. So please do speak to your healthcare provider about the appropriateness of cannabis as a treatment option. For those who have taken some steps in improving your quality of life, congratulations. And remember, your journey is your journey. And as long as you're taking some steps forward in improving the quality of your life, you should be very proud of the progress that you're making. At Weedwell, we are committed to helping people improve their quality of life, and utilizing cannabis as a treatment option is one way to accomplish that. On behalf of Doug, who is not with us today, my colleague Paul, and myself, we look forward to the next time that you join us. And until then, be well. Thanks for joining us this week on the Path to Be Well podcast, a podcast about being well. Make sure to visit our website at weedwell.com where you can subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this week's show, we'd appreciate you sharing this podcast or leaving a comment or reading. We look forward to you joining us next time. Until then, be well.